Tonight, I hope we will be able to study some very important terms because they're found in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they are distinct. Now, we won't be able to go through all of them, but there's a difference, for example, between the last days, the day of the Lord, the day of God, the day of Christ. All of those terms are used in the New Testament to refer to specific aspects of the Lord's return. Tonight, I hope we can at least get through the day of the Lord. I gave you just a little overview of that last week, but we want to look extensively at passages both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. That's what we find over here in Revelation chapter 1, although we're looking at verses 9 through um, 20 tonight, we're going to start reading at verse 1. Revelation chapter 1. The Son of Man vision part 2. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet, like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. 
Gracious Father, we pray for your blessing upon the going forth of your word tonight, that you will give us understanding and clarity. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to understand how the Old Testament prophecies relate to what we look at tonight. And Father, we pray that you will give us not only a, a sense of understanding, but that you'll thrill our hearts with joy, knowing that the end is near, knowing that soon we will see our Lord Jesus Christ, that the things of earth will all disappear for us, that we'll stand in his presence. We look forward to that, Father. We pray your blessing upon this, your word tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall that last week we began by looking at verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the word, uh, isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The first thing we saw was that John personally identified with all the other Christians. They had greater authority than the other Christians, but they never lorded it over other believers like popes and prelates later did. John identifies as your brother. The second thing we saw, the apostles did not escape suffering any more than the other Christians. John was the only one of the disciples who was not martyred, and he was condemned to work the Roman mines at Patmos until he dropped dead. And so he testifies as your companion in tribulation. And of course, uh, for the last two weeks in Sunday morning, we've been studying how suffering comes before glory. Third, although there is coming a literal earthly millennial kingdom, Clearly revealed, both in the Old and New Testament, there is a mystery aspect of the kingdom that is currently present. We'll discuss that when we get farther into Revelation. But we see that in the phrase, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Fourth, the Isle Patmos. That's a small rocky island, 50 square miles. It's out in the middle of the ocean. John was considered a ringleader of the Christians, so he was banished there by Domitian in about 95 AD. Fifth, he was specifically banished because of his vocal Christian testimony. For the testimony, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then we got to verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. Now, last week, I just briefly told you my conclusions concerning the Lord's Day, but I want to go into depth both in the New Testament passages and the Old Testament passages where that is found so that we'll understand why the book of Revelation starts with that phrase since most of the book of Revelation deals with the day of the Lord. It doesn't mean Sunday. As I mentioned last week, the Greek text literally speaks of the Lordish day or the Lordian day. This, by the way, is the only place in the Bible where we have the English phrase, the Lord's day. Now, we've picked that up in church history and we use that to refer to Sunday, but that's not based on anything that you find in the Bible. I read one commentary on this uh, some time ago where he thought that the Lord's day must be Easter Sunday. But uh, there's not a lot in the text to support that. However, there's a lot in the text to support the uh, proposition that we're talking about the day of the Lord. In the New Testament, the phrase is clearly not talking about Sunday, which the New Testament consistently calls the first day of the week, consistently. Specifically because Christians are no longer under the Sabbath regulations. That's why it's called the first day of the week. The, the writers wanted to make sure that the church wasn't meeting on Saturday, which is the seventh day of the week, which is the Sabbath. Sunday is not the so-called Christian Sabbath. There's nothing in the New Testament that ever talks about a switch between Saturday and Sunday and bringing the Sabbatarian regulations of Saturday and plopping them down on Sunday. You won't find that anywhere in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there were both weekly Sabbaths and special high holy days, which were also called Sabbaths. Sometimes the high holy days fell on different days of the week, like Yom Kippur does this year, for example. But the weekly Sabbaths are always on Saturday every time they are mentioned, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. To understand the issue, and thus to understand prophecy as it relates to Israel and the church, we must distinguish between Israel and the church. Otherwise, you won't understand huge portions of prophecy. 
You'll say, how does that fit with us? Israel and the church are not one and the same. The Sabbath was given to Israel as a sign of their special national relationship with God. The Bible specifically says it, and I'll quote the verse in a minute. It was never given to the church as a sign. It was given to national Israel as a sign. And God says not only is it a sign between him and Israel, but it's a perpetual sign between him and Israel. During the millennial reign of Christ, the Sabbath is going to be reinstituted, and there are going to be temple sacrifices in the millennial period because that relates specifically to Israel. Now, let me give you the passage where that's found. That's Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 through 17. And we find some very important things related to the Sabbath here. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel. Not the church, the children of Israel. That's a phrase that is always used for the Jews saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. Because you remember there are plural Sabbaths. For, listen, listen to this phrase, For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Verse 14, Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Now get the next phrase. Do you really want the Sabbath? Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Ah, that's six. But the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Verse 16. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. This is a covenant God made with Israel. It, verse 17. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And many who want to transfer the Sabbath over to the church say, well, but you see, it goes back to creation, and uh, since we're all created by God, and blah, they're missing the main point of the passage. God uses that to illustrate why he's doing the Sabbath, because he rested on the Sabbath day, but it was the seventh day, not the first day. And it was given as a sign to Israel, to whom he gave the law, including the book of Genesis, which speaks of the seventh day when God rested. So if you want to claim Sunday as the Sabbath and that the church is Israel, which is uh, not very good theology, that's called replacement theology, you must transfer the entire Sabbath law to the church, not just the parts of the Sabbath law that you like. Sabbath violation required the death penalty. We read that twice there. If you worked on the Sabbath, you were to be killed. Not just put in jail, not just given a couple of licks, not just scolded. You were to be killed. Have you ever worked on Sunday? Have you ever worked, let's say, okay, still, Sabbath is Saturday. Have you ever worked on Saturday? I know most of us here have worked on Saturday. You ought to be killed if we're under the law. I don't care whether you choose Saturday or Sunday. You ought to be killed if we're still under the Sabbath law. You see, the law is a unit. You cannot take it piecemeal. And James says so. Let me read you the passage in James 2, verses 10 and 11. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. It's like a gigantic chain. You know, up at West Point, they had this chain that big links like this that stretched across the Hudson River so that ships could not go past that point uh, which was being defended. You know how many links you have to break to break the chain and get a ship through? One. One. The law is a unit. 
And then James goes on, for he that said, remember, if you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. It's a unit. And by the way, those are, of course, quotes out of the Ten Commandments. James is saying, you understand what the law is about? It does not justify you. It condemns you. The law can't save you. The law cannot sanctify you. The law can only show you that you are a sinner. And God put the death penalty on that one related to the Sabbath. Weren't death penalties for all of them, but death penalty for Sabbath breaking. You see, however, we're not under the law and we're not justified by the law. Romans 6.14 For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Galatians 3, 10 and through 13. For as many are as of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things, in all things, which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Jump down to verse 23 and 24 and 25. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up that the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, get it, to bring us to Christ. We looked in despair. There was no way to be saved by the law. It's a schoolmaster. One who beats you when you don't learn the lesson. He was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after the faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Do you get it? That's the law, folks. All of it. Not just the Ten Commandments. And then he talks about those who want to go back to all those special days. But now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? He's been talking about the law. And then he says those are weak and beggarly elements. And what do those include? You observe days and months and times and years. That includes the Sabbath. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Find the same thing in the book of Acts, Acts 13, 39. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. How about Romans chapter 3, verse 20 and 28? Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's what it does. It shows you where you're a sinner. Doesn't save you, doesn't help you, doesn't give you power to keep the law. It merely points out and condemns you for breaking it. Verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. How about Galatians 2.16 and Galatians 3.11 and Galatians 5.4? Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Verse 11, chapter 3. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. From Habakkuk 2.4. Galatians 5.4, Christ has become of no effect to you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now, if that's not enough, one of the things that has always struck me as very, very interesting and apropos to this topic is that certain sections of the law, for example, nine of the Ten Commandments, are restated in the New Testament, but on a totally different basis. The Old Testament law said, for example, thou shalt not steal. 
That's restated in the New Testament, but it is expanded on a new foundation. Let him that stole steal no more. So there's your parallel. Don't steal. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather, now here's the addition, but rather let him labor with his hands the thing that is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. That goes far beyond what the Old Testament required. Don't steal. He says don't steal, but instead have the right kind of a job, work hard, earn money, and then find a neighbor that needs money and help him out. That's based on love, not on law. It's a higher calling, a higher standard, a higher empowerment by the Spirit of God. That was never available. The permanently indwelling Holy Spirit in the Old Testament under the law period. The Sabbath is the only one of the Ten Commandments that is not restated in the New Testament after Pentecost. Sunday is never referred to as the Sabbath. Never. You won't find it anywhere in the Bible. Sunday is always called the first day of the week in the New Testament. That is true in all four Gospels. It is true in Acts, and it is true in the Epistles. For example, Matthew 28, 1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Mark 16, 2. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Mark 16, 9. Now when Jesus was risen early, the first day of the week, he appeared first Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Luke. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. John, chapter 20, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. John 20, verse 19. Then, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Acts, chapter 20, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. It's quite clear that the phrase, the first day of the week, using it to refer to Sunday, was the day of the Christians, and it is never called the Sabbath. Whenever you find the term Sabbath in the New Testament, it always refers to the seventh day of the week, not the first day of the week. In other words, it would be very strange for John to be using the phrase the Lordian day to speak of Sunday in light of the consistent usage in the rest of the New Testament calling Sunday the first day of the week. However, the Lordian day makes perfect sense when we understand that phrase in light of the majority of the context of the book of Revelation, which primarily is concerned with the day of the Lord. The Hebrew phrase used throughout the Old Testament is the day of the Lord. That is a very specific period set out in the Old Testament in extensive detail, and I hope we can get to a whole bunch of verses on that tonight. And then the New Testament adds additional detail. When the day of the Lord arrives, the church which, of course, as you've heard me say many times, is a mystery in the Old Testament. The church is nowhere in sight. When the day of the Lord shows up, there's no church. Very important to remember that. Now that we have the New Testament, we know the reason why. This entire church age, from beginning of the church age to the entire content of the church age to the end of the church age, is not seen in the Old Testament. It was revealed, it was not revealed until Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And we, uh, those of you who were with us when we studied Acts, we studied that in great detail when we studied Acts 2. Secondly, since the church is raptured prior to the tribulation, we would not expect to find the first day of the week called the Lord's Day during the tribulation as described in Revelation. So let's talk about the day of the Lord. When the Old Testament closed, the day of the Lord had not yet come. It was still in anticipation at the end of the book of Malachi, 
we'll see that in the very last chapter of Malachi, it mentions in the last verse, the coming of the day of the Lord. So it hadn't happened as of the end of the Old Testament. The day of the Lord has not come during this period of divine history, which we call the church age. And you'll see that for sure after we begin to read the passages and you say, whoa, that's going to be one hairy time. Paul makes it clear that the day of the Lord is yet future in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2. And Paul also gives the practical application as to how we should live since the day of the Lord has not yet arrived and the day of the Lord is a time of unprecedented judgment on the world. Let me read you these short verses here out of 1 Thessalonians 5. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, this is not talking about the rapture here because he begins to describe it for you. Here's the day of the Lord coming as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, everybody thinks if everything's okay, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail over a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But don't worry, guys, because the next verse is there too. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day, what day are we talking about? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not going to overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Verse 9, very important. First phrase in verse 9, very important. The Bible tells us God has appointed the world to wrath. But what about the believer? There's an us and them, us and them, us and them. They shall say, but we, that they, but we. Here it is. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. That means, folks, you, if you're a true believer, are not going to go through the period of wrath called the Great Tribulation, called the time of Jacob's sorrow, called the time of Jacob's trouble, called the wrath of the day of the Lord. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me in advance give you a brief summary. There are four major points to this a brief summary of what and when, what constitutes the day of the Lord and when will it happen. Number one, every time you find that phrase, the day of the Lord, it relates to the second coming of Christ, never to his first coming. Always relates to the second coming, not the first. Number two, you will never find it equated with or related to the rapture other than the fact that it starts immediately after the rapture, as in our passage I just read you. Never related to the rapture, other than the fact that it starts immediately after the rapture. Number three, and this is down the road a few weeks, because we're going to have to look at some very important passages in Daniel to understand the tribulation period that's being described in the book of Revelation. But... It begins with a period referred to as the 70th week of Daniel. The 70th week of Daniel, which specifically and distinctly relates to national Israel. I mean, that's very, very clear when you read about it in the book of Daniel. Very important prophecy in the book of Daniel. There are 69 weeks, and then Messiah the Prince is cut off. And then there's a 70th week. And as you read the description of the 70th week, which are weeks of years, and that's very clear from what you read in the book of Daniel. We'll talk about that when we get to it. There are seven years left. A week of years, seven years. 69 weeks, 483 years from the going forth of the decree to rebuild the temple until the cutting off of Messiah the Prince. Sir Robert Anderson, in his book, The Coming Prince, figured it out to the day. 
from the time the decree went forth to build the temple until Jesus Christ was crucified on Mount Calvary. And then there's a break. And then there are yet seven years to be fulfilled. And that's what's described for us in the seven years of the Great Tribulation. So the 70th week of Daniel relates to national Israel. The 69th week of Daniel ended with the cutting off of Messiah the Prince. The church, not revealed in the Old Testament, intervenes at that point. Once the church is gone, the 70th week of Israel starts up again. It's like Israel's time clock is getting started up again. Number four, the day of the Lord extends from his coming as a thief in the night to the destruction and meltdown of the current heavens and earth. In addition to the passage we just cited out of 1 Thessalonians 5, here are some of the key New Testament references as follows. Now we obviously can't cover every verse in these tonight, but I want to at least read a few of them. The Olivet Discourse is two chapters long, so I'm not going to read both chapters, but that's Matthew 24 and 25. Jesus, after they, uh, he was betrayed, uh, or Judas went out into the night, Jesus took his disciples, they went up, and he preached what's called the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25. Jesus went out, departed from the temple, his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So the first thing he tells them is about the current destruction of the temple. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Now here's the question that Jesus is going to answer. Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? I'm not talking about the rapture here. We're going to answer a question about the signs of his coming and a question that deals with the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. We definitely see these kinds of things increasing around the world right now. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And you've heard me preach out of Hosea about the last three days of the tribulation period and how Israel at that time, who is on the point of annihilation, cries out for their Messiah. These are the Jews who are still alive. These are the ones who have still endured unto the end. And Jesus Christ hears their prayer. They recognize that he was the Messiah. They turn to him in repentance and he comes back and rescues them. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye, therefore, shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by who? Daniel the prophet. So a lot of what we're seeing here in Matthew chapter 24 relates to what Daniel prophesied and his 70th week. When you see that abomination of desolation, and we find in the New Testament that's where Antichrist sets up an image of himself in the temple, which has not yet been rebuilt. He'll be rebuilding it. So these things can't happen right now. The church has to be out of here so the Antichrist can take control, pretend to be a friend of Israel, build the temple for them. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, Oh my, instead of the Ark of the Covenant, in the holiest place of all, the Holy of Holies, you see the abomination of desolation, an image of the Antichrist, which the false prophet can make to speak and work miracles in the sight of 
the Antichrist and in the sight of the world, demonically empowered. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in uh, South India flee into the mountains, and in America flee into the mountains, and in China flee into the... Does it say that? Let them which be where? In Judea. Judea is where Jerusalem is located and where the Temple Mount is located. This is a specific prophecy that relates to Israel. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Better to go with very little clothes on your back than to get caught at this time. Woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Pregnant women are going to have a really hard time. Now listen to the next part. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Who's Jesus talking to? Jewish disciples. In what context is he talking? The Antichrist in Jerusalem, Judea, fleeing to the mountains. Don't hope that it's not on the Sabbath day because then you're going to be breaking some Sabbath laws and you're in trouble. Jewish context. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And you, you've heard me preach on that, the six different ways in which the term elect is used in the New Testament. It doesn't always refer to the church. Christ is called the elect, for example. There are called elect angels. Israel is called the elect. That those days should be shortened, there should no be fl flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. They'd ask what? They'd ask, what's the sign of your coming, and when's the end of the world going to be? He's answering those questions. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Don't get tricked by that. No, he's not out in the desert. Behold, he's in the secret chambers. Believe it not. That's not the way that I'm going to show up against this Jesus. I don't have to hide out. I don't have to be in some remote location so they can't catch me. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be visible. The whole earth is going to see it. It's going to be in pitch black, as we'll see when we get to the book of Revelation, down to the bold judgments, where all the lights of heaven are turned out. And then Christ, in the Shekinah glory, with his armies from heaven, begins to descend to earth, and the whole world sees him. This blaze of glory heading toward earth, and they're in a panic. And the Antichrist begins to gather his armies for the battle of Armageddon to fight against the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an incredible scene when you put these passages together with the book of Revelation. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That's how Jesus is coming back at the second coming. Not at the rapture. This is where everybody sees him. At the rapture, nobody sees him. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. In the twinkling of an eye, that's not just even a blink of the eye. The twinkling is when the light reflects off your eye and bounces out. How fast is that? That's how fast the rapture is. There's quite a difference between that and every eye seeing him and wailing because of him as in perfect darkness he begins to descend from heaven to earth. Even as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. 
and we'll talk about that if we have time at some point in relation to the Battle of Armageddon. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his elect, his angels, with a great sound of the trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. Now these are the elect during the tribulation period. You see, for example, 144,000. Uh, who are Jewish male virgins. But there are others who trust Christ, not those who have heard before. Those who have heard the gospel and reject the gospel cannot be saved during the tribulation period. Paul says so. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, therefore God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So, Pray for your friends right now with whom you have shared Christ because if the rapture takes place and they go into the tribulation, they will gladly take the mark of the beast. They will not trust Christ and be saved. But there are many who have not yet heard and some very special groups as we'll see as we get later on in the book. He shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. The fig tree is a picture and type of Israel. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. It may stand at the door. It may pause at the door. It may push the door a little crack so that you sense the presence there. When you see these things happening, you know that something's about to happen. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, we've talked about the preterist interpretation of that, which says, oh, well, everything here happened in 70 AD. Everything was fulfilled in 70 AD, so there's no more future prophecy for anything to go on, except someday we're all who've trusted Christ are going to go to heaven and everybody else is going to go to hell, though some preterists don't believe in hell. But, but it's all over. All, all these prophecies, don't have to worry about prophecy anymore, don't have to study prophecy anymore. Um, you know, it all got completely fulfilled in 70 AD. This generation is a reference to Israel. That's the context here. This generation, we talk about a generation today, we think of that term in terms of 40 years. But this generation means the seed that goes forth from the generation of. God is not going to let Israel wiped out. 2,000 years later, we still have Israel. Distinct, clearly distinct Jews from every point on the face of the earth, and they're back in the land. Folks, the stage is ripe right now for the rapture and then for the, sadly, tribulation. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as, in the, as the days of Noah were, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days that were before the flood, which was God's judgment on the world, so we're talking about judgment coming on the world, as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We're talking judgment. Peter does the same thing. He compares the flood of Noah to the second coming of Christ and the destruction of the earth. We'll see that passage in a few minutes, the Lord willing. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come, but know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, now, we find that thief image in multiple passages in the New Testament related to the second coming. Pick up on it each time I talk, and each time I read a verse, and you say, oh, there's that thief image again. The thief image again. The thief image again. If the good men of the house had known what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Do what God called you to do. 
Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if, that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and to drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and point him his portion with the hypocrites. And there should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now that's one of the key passages in the New Testament, and it takes a while to read through it, but with a little bit of commentary, so that when we get to those portions in the book of Revelation, you'll say, ah, oh, yes, I remember hearing that out of Matthew. And when we get to Daniel, say, wow, I never realized there was so much in Daniel that's also over here in the book of Revelation. Now, a shorter passage over in Luke chapter 12, we find in verse 35, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from a wedding. Returning from a wedding, not going to a wedding. The rapture is the bride being caught up for the wedding. The wedding feast of the Lamb lasts for seven years in heaven, and now we're talking about the Lord returning from the wedding. That's at the end of that period of time. The bride in heaven with Christ at the wedding feast of the Lamb, the judgments of God being poured out upon the earth during that seven-year period, which is called the Great Tribulation. That when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. It was in the middle of the night. And this know that if the good men of the house... Ah, now look at this. Luke mentions it also. That if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. And he said, now wait a minute, it seems like in both those passages, Jesus is comparing himself to the thief who sneaks into the house and robs it. We'll answer that question later, the Lord willing. But just think about that for a minute. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even unto all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens, and to eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him. God guarantees it. He will catch those who are not looking for him by surprise, and in an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. Still going to get beaten, because he ought to have known his Lord's will. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Now we see it in the context of fire and judgment, the day of the Lord. Second Peter chapter 3. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of this Lord and Savior. So, here's something that was spoken before by the holy prophets. Peter's referring to Old Testament prophets. It's not the New Testament prophets. Otherwise, he would be quoting stuff from New Testament writers, but he doesn't. He quotes stuff from Old Testament writers. So be mindful of the words that were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Two distinct things. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? 
For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Those, it's the old evolutionary cycle. Nothing changes. It's just a slow process. We just keep cranking along. And then Peter says, now here's the problem. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So, he takes us back to the flood, just like Jesus did. There was a judgment in the past. It's a reminder that judgment is coming. God promised never to destroy the world again by water. That's what the rainbow is all about. You read that little article I stuck, I hope, in your bulletin this morning. But there's another judgment coming, not with water, but a judgment of fire. And here's how Peter explains it. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment, a perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And that is also taken out of context. We'll talk about that in a second by people who believe in theistic evolution. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Why does God delay? He tells you. But is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any, and that's of us, the elect, the not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now here we have it. Here's our phrase. And look, he uses the same phraseology that we saw both in Matthew and Luke. The day of the Lord. So he's talking about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. He's talking about the same thing Jesus was talking about in Matthew and the same thing Jesus was talking about in Luke. In the which, now here he's describing what's going to happen during the day of the Lord. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, all that junk you hold on to down here on earth, all those things of earth, the nice little tidy stuff that you've got tucked away in the bank account somewhere in Switzerland. Well, I suspect most of us don't have it in Switzerland. Probably have it in the local bank, which is not very safe in any case. But it's going to dissolve. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of, now here's another of our terms we'll talk about later, the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for these things, be diligent that ye be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. That motif, the thief in the night, is also repeated over in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So our time is up, but let me at least summarize very quickly for you what we've just seen. I went through those passages kind of quickly. On the basis of those passages, we see that the day of the Lord includes both Christ's second coming and the thousand-year millennial kingdom and the final dissolution of the current heavens and earth at the end of the millennium. In other words, it's a thousand seven years long. In the Old Testament prophecies, which speak of the day of the Lord, Israel and its relationship to the Gentile nations is always in view. Every time you find the phrase, the day of the Lord, in the Old Testament, Israel and its Gentile nations that are surrounding it, are trying to hurt it, or who are being judged by God, Israel, national Israel, and the Gentile nations that are putting pressure on it are always in view. But the church is never in view. Let me give you some illustrations of the day of the Lord in the Old Testament, and we'll wait until next week to do that, but I've got them out of all kinds of books of the Old Testament. We have Peter, uh, yes, on the day of Pentecost, quoting one of the day of the Lord passages out of Joel chapter 2, and how do you answer that question? But the Lord willing, we'll pick that up next week. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, 
and for the fact that you have woven it together meticulously so that we can't miss the point without just being stubborn about it. And your revelation of Jesus Christ certainly tells us what it'll be like during the day of the Lord and ties together many of these Old Testament prophecies. Our Lord alluded to it himself. We find it being alluded to by the apostles in the epistles. And then we find it described in full bloom in the book of Revelation. Father, we thank you that you have not appointed us unto wrath, but unto salvation. And because of that, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Eschatology should not merely be something to tickle our ears. It should be a life-changing motivation to live a holy life. We're looking for Christ. We're not just looking at signs. We're looking for Christ. We're looking for the blessed hope. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. The prophetic future is one of the most powerful motivators for us, if we believe it properly, one of our most powerful motivators to live lives of holiness and godliness. Help us to see that, Father, and then help us day by day to earnestly and to honestly strive to live a life that is so pleasing to Christ that we will not be ashamed at his coming. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.